Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're going to do the top five perfumes for the month of March. Time flies. I mean, it's like yesterday was New Year's Eve and then all of a sudden, and just like that, here we are. Rolling our way towards spring and uh, the mid of the year. Now, I have to say, March is one of those months, right? <laughs> it's like half of, more than half of it is still winter. And then like the last fourth of it is spring. So technically we can envision March as spring, but it is for the most part still winter, or let's just say like kind of the last, the end of winter. So let's get to it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already here on the tubes. You can push the notification bell to get notified every time I post a new video. You can also push the join button next to the subscription button to become a member. Today gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Decaball spelled together there for extra perks. Thank you to my members and patrons who have already pledged. The first perfume is... Um, usually a fragrance that I love to wear in July when it's really, really hot, but, well, Northern Hemisphere hot, but I don't know why, for some reason, March this year, is it's it's been calling my name, and you're not going to be able to really see it very well because I'm using a green screen a generated image, so everything that's green is invisible, so I'm going to lift the bottle now. Here it is. <laughs> It's invisible. It's the green bottle of Eden by Cacharel. And, um, oh, you know, this perfume, it's, it's really an if you know, you know moment. I mean, this is one of those Guichard masterpieces from the 90s. Uh, Cacharel really, really slays with this one. You know, Cacharel actually is very underrated. I mean, the perfumes that Cacharel has delivered throughout the decades have consistently been conceptually top-notch. You know, a lot of these fragrances today fall under the cheapy uh, realm, but they're much better than most of the most expensive niches out there, in my humble opinion. But just think about it. Anais Anais in the 70s, you know, uh, Lulu in the 80s. Eden in the 90s, in the 2010s, uh, Yes I Am, which I personally really like, Noah or Noe, uh, another one from Cacharel, which is also really, uh, really good. So they have been quite consistent, you know, they don't release too many perfumes. Yes, they have the tendency of releasing flankers once they release a new fragrance, but the new fragrances usually really hit the spot for me. And then decades later, Oh, they have such a magical power to them. So this is a tuberose-based fragrance and patchouli for the most part. You have those decaying, rotting fruits in this Garden of Eden or Paradise. And uh, man, oh man, it, I mean, I spray this one just behind the knee. It is that powerful. If you put it around your neck, it's just going to suffocate you and everybody else around you. I mean, it's that potent and intense. I would say... Um, in general, this list today is going to be quite tuberose heavy, so bear with me. Uh, tuberose, you know, is a, is a flower. So here we have at the, at the core of this one is also a very particular type of tuberose. But tuberose is a fragrance, is a flower that um, it has a cold heart, but it can also be warm, but it has a menthol type of nuance to it. It has a camphorous, indolic smell to it. If if you take it there, I mean, you can, you know, th there's ways and ways that you can deal with tuberose. Um, the tuberose in here, if you really, really close your eyes and you envision a cooling minty effect, you will sniff it out. If you envision kind of a, a cooling, almost like tiger balmy nuanced tuberose, it, it's in here. And, uh, but uh, it's also slightly bitter, so there's a bitterness to it, which is really, really beautiful. Great for March this year because um, it's a weird chameleon of a fragrance. If it's warmer outside, this perfume can go cooler. If it's cooler outside, this perfume tends to become warm. So uh, just like March can be a little bit confusing, 
you know, in terms of temperatures and rain, sometimes snow, shine. This one as well kind of plays very well that that ball game. So it's very, very intriguing fragrance. Um, for me, in March, 3 p.m. and onwards, this one is not an early, early fragrance for me, early morning fragrance. This is a late afternoon, early evening fragrance for me in March. Because then, you know, March still kind of tends to go a little bit colder in the evenings. That's when this one doesn't work so well. So you, you're going to need a warmer fragrance for the evenings. Um, and uh, in fact, for the evenings, I have a beautifully elegant, like early evenings, not all the way into the night, but those early evening uh, vibes in March to go on a date, maybe a dinner, or just spend the time alone. Um, now we're going into the sandalwood direction without the tuberose. Um, sparkling aldehydes, very, very delicately nuanced sandalwood accord. Uh, and that would be Paris Venice. I love this one. This is a beauty. Oh, so delicate effervescent in a, in a very, very, very beautiful way. This is beautiful for March. Um, it's just Paris Venice or Venice. What can I tell you? It's a very, very subtle sandalwood. You know, it, it, it's a soft, soft, I mean, Les Eaux de Chanel, Olivier Paul, I guess he envisioned these as colognes, but then Chanel's marketing team, allegedly, everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. Seems as though they didn't want to price them too low. So they kind of said, you know what, let's not call these colognes. Let's call them auto toilettes. Because the whole concept of these, you know, waterlets by Chanel, they're very light. Okay. Except for Paris Paris, which has a bombastic lasting power, but that's, it's, it's the damask rose with the patchouli. It's very, very intense. Here, every, every element is very subdued. Very moderate lasting power, but it's wet and dry at the same time. Again, we have this game, just like with Eden. Uh, with Eden, we had the cold, contrasting warm, warm, contrasting cold vibe. Here we go into the humidity aspect of March. So this one um, smells humid at times, but also at times it smells dry. It does have a powdery accord in there as well. It has a, a botanical accord that almost goes mossy, humid, foresty in a way. Uh, and when it goes into that humid vibe, it really, really works very well on rainy days. It actually does. But then on the dry days, it also works wonders because it smells powdery and dry. Very interesting perfume that at times smells natural. And then at other times it smells synthetic, but synthetic in a very elevated, elegant way. It's a beauty. I highly recommend Paris Venice for March. And it hasn't been on my list for a while now, but I've been rediscovering it for myself. In fact, quite a dent in the bottle, almost empty. Actually, when these were first released, I stocked up, I bought two. So I still, <laughs> from the first batch ever, I still have a, a full bottle waiting for me. And then I purchased the 50 mil when they introduced the 50 mils as well for travel purposes. This is batch code 2703. This is the first one made almost more or less, but it's from the first release from my fashion, uh, from my beauty boutique. This was the, um, this was the first release. Now we're going back into the tuberose realm. And let me tell you something. This is a beauty for March because um, it definitely promises spring. It promises flowers. It promises life. It promises energy. But it does it in a very sophisticated way like human beings would do, you know, like um, pharmacists would do, like alchemists would do, like... People who know their chemistry would do. 
And so there is a flower there, but there's also aldehydes. There's also um, almost a metallic chemical component to this fragrance, which is really, really insane. But the tuberose, just like with um, Paris Venice, even though there's no tuberose there, but it goes cold and it goes warm. It goes slightly indolic. It has that minty vibe to it, but it also has a buttery metallic ambrosial vibe as well. And that would be Patricia de Nicolai's number one intense. Oh, how I love this tuberose. I, and I, honestly, I love to wear this on a rainy day. On a cold, damp, cloudy, rainy day. Because this one just blossoms and, and it makes you feel like, well, actually, it's sunny outside. Actually, it's warm outside. Actually, it's dry outside. It, this one just like boosts and peps your mood up incredibly. What is so magical about this one, I think Patricia de Nicolai, I think Patricia really knows her chemistry because this is a true tuberose to me. It's just like the plant of the tuberose, the flower of the tuberose when it when it when it blossoms, uh, it it slithers and tends to creep up on you from very very far distances. It's transported by the wind and the air, and uh, you get wafts of it, and you're kind of looking for it. Like wait wait a minute, where's the tuberose? But you can't find it. Like let's say a tuberose plant is not really growing in your garden, but like three gardens away, and you you can still sense it. It's it's amazing. The same effect uh, you get when you wear this on your skin. Like even six hours later, I would just get a waft of tuberose and I would I would surprise myself. I'd be like, wow, wh where did it come from? <laughs> and it came from the spot you sprayed it on. So uh, it, it's, it keeps you guessing in a way. It's a beautifully, masterfully playful, coquette type of fragrance. It flirts with you just like tuberose would. And as we all know... The history of the tuberose flower, it was forbidden for young virgin girls to even pass by the tuberose in a bloom because, uh, well, legend wants it that this fragrance, not this fragrance, well, this fragrance maybe too, but that the flower would uh, make the ladies lose their virginity instantly just from the smell of it alone. It's that narcotically intoxicating. So you can imagine how the tuberose is intense and it has that way of tantalizing you, luring you in. I think it's a beautiful way to initiate spring because there's that promise of life and blooming life and energy and sexuality in the air. That's why I think uh, it's kind of cool to have tuberose-based fragrances in March. Number one intense from the 80s, still in production. Now as an eau de parfum, not as an eau de toilette, with the added intense to the name by Patricia de Nicolai, parfumeur créateur. Ah, oh, what a beauty. The next one is another 80s, 80s fragrance. Uh, it is intense. It's opulent. It is in, in my list for March because of nostalgic reasons. Um... The smell, you know, we could have gone with Obsession by Calvin Klein, but I wanted something a little bit more spicy, edgy. And yes, for many people, this fragrance is kind of um, piggybacking off of Obsession by Calvin Klein because Obsession did come before this one. But I love this one and it's so special in its own right and I respect it for what it is and I think that in its own right it is a self-standing fragrance, even though it comes from an era where obsession ruled the world. Mm. You can't see the green, <laughs> but uh, it's the Italian flag in, in, um, in uh, ribbon form. So green, white, and red, but it is Moschino's first fragrance and it's called Moschino. Simply Moschino or Moschino by Moschino. Uh, it is in the shape of a wine bottle. The idea is to, you know, represent 
the quintessential Italian form. In fact, the first advertisement for this uh, fragrance, you had a model, uh, there was a straw in the bottle and she was like kind of drinking the Moschino wine out of the bottle. And then um, the advertisement said like, not, you know, like don't drink. It's not made to be drunk. You know, it's like kind of this whole playfulness, typical Franco Moschino, really. He would play with all of these notions and concepts of what's allowed, what's not allowed, transforming the imagery, or the imagery and the meaning of a product and making it all of a sudden means something totally different than what you would be used to. So in this case, uh, Moschino by Moschino is a wine bottle, but in, in reality, you, you, you know, it's also an earring. Um, in fact, the top of it is a pearl with that rounded circular. In fact, there, there was a limited edition of this one that came with in a set with a two clip-on earrings, which were literally the lids, the stoppers of the fragrance, and then they would kind of hang off the ear like this. I think more like this or like this, maybe. But then, you know, we're so used to seeing these. This is typical for the 80s. Chanel also did these a lot. That kind of glass pearl with the gold around it as clip-ons. So there's a lot of details in this bottle. You know, we have the first in show the ribbon but also presents italy and of course you can take it off so this is almost like a beauty pageant and the bottle one first in show uh, then we have the earring aspect we have the wine bottle aspect and then we have the smell and the smell is a beauty it's a mixture of a lot of different i mean you know nowadays we don't call fragrances oriental anymore so um we could, you could call it an amber accord, quite spicy, dry as well. It does have aldehydes. Euro Italia is the producer of this one or the distributor still to this day. They've been distributing Moschino fragrances since forever. And uh, yes, it has been reformulated, but I got to say, it, it falls under the cheapy range. You can find this one on Amazon often as well. That's where I got mine for a really good price. Um, and it's not really, you can't really find this one on the Moschino website when you, you know, you can order perfumes there. Uh, but uh, so this one has that kind of niche distribution, well, niche. It has that weird distribution. You find it in the weirdest places, but not like in big perfumeries. So in a way, this one is niche because you got to hunt it down. So we got the powder, we got the amber. There's a smidge of violet there, nutmeg, nuts, <laughs> nuts, a lot of spices and nuts and woods. There, it, it has a floral accord to it as well. It's soft but spicy and uh, it's fluffy, does have shoulder pads, very 80s. So th this to me is a time travel machine back to the time when Franco Moschino was still alive. He was alive to see the launch of this one. You know, I like it because it's like a promise of for life, and it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful setback to the '80s, to a wonderful, glorious, decadent, fun, playful time in history for fashion, but also politically speaking, there was a lot of tensions, but there was also a lot of zest in the air, and, and people were experimenting, trying stuff on. Now, granted, this is the late '80s, so we're already kind of heading towards the whole grunge movement. I mean, Nirvana is just around the corner. Well, actually, they're already there. But you know what I mean? So this one almost smells like the clinging out of the grandeur of the 80s. This is kind of one of those last moments of the beautiful 80s era that is about to end and we're about to enter a gorgeous 90s era. But this one is right there at the cusp just like March is at the cusp, you know, the ending of winter and the beginning of spring. So this perfume really sets the tone for me and defines this moment of transition. Yeah, that's the thing, transition. As you can see, it's a cusp of everything. It's an earring, but it's a perfume. It's a wine bottle, but it's a perfume. It's a beauty pageant, but it's also pet patriotic in a way, but, but it's a perfume. So it's you know, if you kind of squint a little, it can be a lot of different things. Um, it's a mutant in a way, a very March. Number five, and we're back to the tuberose. Uh, perchance one of the mothers of all tuberoses uh, from uh, the 40s. 
Mm. Or was it 1939? One doth forget. Well, it's uh, uh, Robert Piguet and it is Fraca, the Eau de Parfum concentration. What can I tell you? I check out my review of this one on my channel. Uh, we talk about the Black Dahlia uh, when we talk about this perfume. Oof. We talk about mystery, we talk about suspense, we talk about thriller, we talk about noir, uh, we talk about the more dangerous nuance of tuberose. It is a, it, it's that bubble gummy tuberose accord, very heavy, uh, very indolic, buttery almost. This one goes way beyond uh, the butter. Indolic butter aspect of tuberose. It's very sensual, very sexual, but also very cold. So again, very March. It's very much... There's still winter there, but then it's also kind of... It, there's winter, but... But it's also spring. Um, it's not hot yet, you know? Uh, it's it's still cold outside. And there's danger in the air. We don't know what's going to happen this year. Everything is... There's suspense. There's a, a willingness to find out what's going to happen. But at the same time, there's like a frozen vibe going on you feel like you can't move forward uh, you're, you're stuck in the past in a weird way it's a very very bizarre fragrance um uh, it shocks you in a way it stops you it, it you know in cold blood it almost kind of makes you freeze in, but it's also sensual it's also very sexual it's very erotic it's very inviting alluring and, and dangerous and um you know, I remember a time when March still quite cold, but it, it especially towards the end of March, this one when it's already spring, and then we're kind of it's almost almost April, and then when when April comes, you're the chlorophyll is going to blast and bloom, and it, the green outside is going to be so intense and green, and and all of those feelings inside of you reawaken, and you you know you 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 get hornier and you do more stuff and. You, there's more tension. There's more like you're gearing up for danger, you know. Uh, hunting season is about to begin. And this one really announces it. Th this one sets the tone. It it's still a sleeping monster, but it's about to wake up. That's the vibe that Fraka is giving me this month. It's a dangerous sleeping monster, and it's about to awaken. That's the tuberose in this one. Very, 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 very awesome, but also very dangerous. So get this one and use this one at your own risk. I-Y-K-Y-K. -Y -K. Anyway, those will be my top five perfumes for the month of March 2024. Hope you've enjoyed the list. Let me know your favorites for this month down below and comment on any one of these five uh, if you liked them. Or if you do have any of these, what would be your favorite instance on, in wearing them? Like, when would you wear them best? Maybe March is not the best time for you to wear these. Let me know. When would be the best time? Especially, I want to know for Vraga. When would this one be your best? But anyway, you know what I mean? We'll go, we'll go. Until next time, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thumb it up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe and never give up on love. Bye.